Thank you. It is a great privilege as a legal academic to be invited to speak to so many practitioners um, about the questions surrounding domestic contracts. Um, I'm not sure why an academic speaker was put first. Perhaps it was to serve as a sort of secular benediction to the day's educational proceedings or to gently lull those who are here into, uh, into the program or, dare I say, to uh, permit those who are late to arrive on time for the session on lawyer's malpractice. Um, my intent today is to put some of the proceedings into a substantive law context, and this is a particularly appropriate time to be doing that because there are three recent Supreme Court of Canada decisions, Pellish, Richardson, and Carroll, which raise fundamental questions and answer certain questions about domestic contracts. Uh, Professor Jay McLeod has referred to them as perhaps the most significant advancement in matrimonial case law of the 20th century. That may be slightly hyperbolic, but it's, they're certainly important decisions. You may notice in your materials there is a paper uh, which I've written uh, at the front of those materials which surveys most of the salient features of the law of domestic contracts. Uh, I can't possibly go through that in uh, the time allotted, and I will not try. I am going to come to some of the highlights of the paper, particularly in regard to the Supreme Court trilogy, and I'll perhaps say a few things orally that I wasn't enthusiastic about saying in writing for one reason or another. Um, I think when considering the law in this area, and particularly the significance of those three decisions, it's important to appreciate that the dominant legal trend, both legislative and judicial, in the past decade has been an encouragement of the non-litigious settlement of matrimonial disputes. The courts and the legislatures have been pushing people away from the uh, adversarial forum. And that, I think, has been a partial response to dealing with the rising divorce rate with its ensuing litigation around matrimonial breakdown, and its attempt to minimize the strain on the individuals and the strain on the court system. And there are many examples of this. I think it's clear from the initiatives of the government in regard to mediation. I think uh, the Family Law Act of 1986, in many ways, some of its provisions which deal with separation agreements and allow the automatic or the facilitate the enforcement of separation agreements are examples of a legislative initiative to uh, push people away from litigation. And I think that the Supreme Court trilogy very much continues and reinforces this trend. The basic issue in the trilogy is when will the courts override a separation agreement? When will the courts say, you thought you had a deal, you may have acted as though you had a deal, but you don't? I think that when considering that question, it's important to remember that it can be looked at in two ways. The first is an attack on the validity of an agreement. And in these decisions, the Supreme Court recognizes that it is still possible to have a frontal attack on the validity of the entire agreement or a part of the agreement. Usually the concept used there is unconscionability, the, the Mundinger and Mundinger approach, uh, what we would now legislatively call an attack under Section 56 sub 4 of the Family Law Act, perhaps an attack on some kind of defect in formalities under Section 55 sub 1 of the Family Law Act. In uh, the paper, there's a discussion about those kind of direct attacks. I would just generally say that the courts have not been particularly receptive to them. It's a fairly high onus to meet. So for example, there are a number of reported cases where somebody said, well, I didn't have a lawyer um, and therefore the agreement should be set aside. It wasn't that great a deal. And the courts have said, well, you, you deliberately chose not to have a lawyer. You have to live with that. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk more during the day about the significance of someone not having a lawyer. Obviously, ideally, both parties should have independent legal advice, but their failure to have it doesn't automatically void the agreement. The, the main focus of the decisions was on a kind of secondary uh, attack, if you want, or a variation approach. Assuming that the agreement cannot be directly attacked, assuming it is valid or was valid when it was made, what is the prospect for subsequent judicial variation? And there are two different kinds of variation situations that the uh, court actually dealt with. One was contractual variation and the other was judicial variation. I'd like to speak for a moment about contractual variation clauses and one of the three cases, Caron and Caron, which arose out of the Yukon, um, considered such a contractual variation clause. 
And I think it's important to know that the court took a very strict interpretive approach to it, which suggests that if you have a contractual variation clause, for example, it says if a certain event occurs, uh, the parties can come back to court or reopen the agreement or whatever, that clause must be drafted extremely carefully. In Caron, and Caron, there was a fairly short separation agreement. There was one clause which provided that spousal support would be terminated if the woman cohabited with another man for at least 90 days. There was a second clause, the contractual variation clause, and if you have the paper there, actually, it's at page 31. Since I'll be talking about it, you may want to just take a quick look at that. And that clause in the middle of the page there, on 30, page 31, said that notwithstanding the terms of the preceding paragraphs, that is to say, notwithstanding the uh, termination clause, uh, if there is a change in circumstances, then either of the parties may seek variation in the quantum of monthly payments by making application to a court or by mutual agreement. Um, what happened was that the woman ended up living with another man for the 90 days, and the husband then stopped making spousal support payments. At the divorce, the wife sought spousal support, relying in part on that contractual variation clause. In the Supreme Court of Canada decision, among other things, it dealt with the interpretation of that clause, and the court focused on the word quantum. And it said because that clause permitted variation in the quantum of support, once support had been fully terminated because of cohabitation, there was no effect to that variation clause because you could only vary the quantum, and when the quantum, if you want, went to zero, there was nothing left to vary. And I think that some people taking a quick look at that clause might be surprised that once you've gone to zero, that you have no, uh, that that clause is, ceases to have effect. A second aspect of this in terms of interpretation of contractual clauses that arose in Caron was, what is the significance of a clause which terminates support on cohabitation? Well, there's a bit of a discussion about that in Caron and in another recent Ontario case, Newfeld and Newfeld, uh, which is discussed in the paper. And in those cases, particularly in the Newfeld case, the courts took a very low interpretation to what constitutes cohabitation. In other words, they said things like, it is enough if the parties are sharing a residence and engaging in sexual relations. It is not necessary for there to be economic interdependence, and it does not seem that there has to be a long period of residence together. And in fact, in the Neufeld case, the parties had separate residences and were spending several nights a week together in various places. And the court said, you're still cohabiting for the purpose of a clause terminating support. And uh, I think they were taking a somewhat different interpretation from that which would usually take to cohabit, for example, in Section 1.1 of the Family Law Act when we're trying to define whether or not there is a so-called common law relationship. That suggests, again, that those kind of clauses which terminate or allow for variation of support contractually have to be very carefully drafted. The courts are taking a very strict approach, and one should spell out exactly what one means. For example, in the cohabitation situation, if one wants cohabitation to go on until there is a new support obligation by somebody else, that should be spelled out perhaps by reference to the Family Law Act. Turning to the other decisions, to Pellish and Richardson, and I think these are the, the two uh, much more important decisions. These cases were decided under the old 1968 Divorce Act, but I'm certain that they will continue to serve as an, a very important interpretive guide under the new Divorce Act 1985. And these decisions dealt with primarily three issues and in fact a number of sub-issues. The first issue was what was the appropriate scope of appellate review in a Divorce Act case. And uh, the court held that an appellate court should not exercise its own discretion when reviewing a trial judgment, but should only interfere if it is satisfied the trial judge made a material error. In other words, they were restricting the scope of appellate review, and if you want, discouraging uh, appellate litigation as well, and saying if you had a trial, that's it unless there was a big mistake. Secondly, and perhaps more interestingly, they dealt with the question of spousal support. And Madam Justice Wilson, I think, is developing a model of support which emphasizes that spousal support is to compensate for needs arising out of roles assumed during marriage. In other words, fault clearly no longer plays a part, um, and certainly it wouldn't under the new legislation. 
And also, there is no automatic entitlement to support. The mere fact that one was a spouse and may suffer because the marriage is over is not enough. I think you have to show some linkage to roles or expectations uh, created or assumed during marriage. A final aspect of the general influence of this decision on support is that I think that it, it, it emphasizes that um, there must be an end to the economic interdependence created by marriage once the marriage is over. And I think that the, in the long term, the effect of this decision will be to emphasize uh, post-divorce independence, i.e., uh, uh, it will tend to limit the length of support orders. Now, I don't think the decision on that last point, the decision is not explicit, but I think that if one reads into some of the paragraphs, and there's quite a lot of discussion in the case about the nature of the law of support, I think that many things there emphasize economic independence much more, say, than the earlier Messier and Delage decision of 1983. The third fundamental issue dealt with was the effect of separation agreements um, on a, the jurisdiction of a court acting under the Divorce Act to deal with support issues. And that's the main topic of our concern today. The first case um, that to come out, in fact, of the trilogy, or they would decide the same day, was Pellish and Pellish, a decision from British Columbia. And that was the longest and fullest judgment, as if you want, the first of the three, um, although it was probably not the most difficult factual situation. In that case, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but I'll just run over the facts, the parties were divorced in 1969 after a 15-year marriage. They entered into a separation agreement which gave the husband custody of the two children of the marriage. He also agreed to pay the woman uh, $29,000 as a lump sum support payment over a 13-month period, and that was stated to be in full satisfaction of all her claims. At that time, his net worth was about $129,000, so she got about one-fifth of the total uh, net worth. The agreement was incorporated into a divorce decree, and the man made all the payments required. For a time, things went reasonably well. The woman was working. She was uh, getting a little bit of money from the interest on the support on the lump sum payments, and she inherited a little bit of money. However, gradually, her physical and mental condition deteriorated, and by 1982, she was on welfare. On the other hand, the man prospered greatly. Um, he ended up being worth close to $2 million. And the woman was in court in 1982 seeking variation of the divorce decree and saying the divorce decree, which incorporated the separation agreement, provided for no support. Now I'm asking for variation for that. And the trial judge and the variation application was understandably perhaps somewhat sympathetic and said, well, the woman's in a terrible position, the man has lots of money, there's been, if you want, a radical change in circumstances and awarded $2,000 a month. However, the British Columbia Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court of Canada uh, both agreed that the woman in this situation should have nothing and if she was on welfare, it was for the state to support her. In writing uh, for the Supreme Court of Canada, Madam Justice Wilson wrote on behalf of five of the six judges, she reviewed the conflicting jurisprudence on the authority of courts to vary or override separation agreements. She clearly favored what she called the private choice approach. In other words, if parties make a decision, if they make a deal, they should live with that. And she stated that when, though the courts under the Divorce Act always have a jurisdiction to override separation agreements, in other words, no matter what the parties say, the courts have an overriding jurisdiction, they should be reluctant to act. And in fact, they should only override spousal support provisions in a separation agreement if the applicant can demonstrate there has been a radical change in circumstances which could be attributed to a pattern of economic dependency established during the marriage. I think that the test that the, court, the Supreme Court of Canada articulated, a radical change in circumstances which could be attributed to roles assumed during the marriage, went beyond that which was in the past articulated by the courts. And in particular, in Ontario, we had a number of decisions, uh, Webb and Webb and Farquhar and Farquhar, among others, from the Ontario Court of Appeal, which talked about a radical change in circumstance as being the test for variation or overriding of a separation agreement. Arguably, in Pelesh, there was a radical change in circumstances. The husband had prospered greatly. The wife's condition had deteriorated greatly. However, it was unable, it was, the, the woman was not able to show that that change was linked to roles assumed during the marriage, and therefore she was not able to have the court overturn the separation agreement. 
Another significant aspect of the decision, the court took a look at the so-called public policy arguments. What's the significance of the fact that the woman is on welfare, that the public is supporting her? And the court said, uh, although there were prior decisions, including Ontario Court of Appeal decisions, that said we should take into account the fact that the public is supporting this woman, the Supreme Court of Canada said, no, the fact that she's receiving welfare doesn't matter. Lots of people are in society are on welfare. If there is no primary obligation on this part of the uh, husband, that's it. I think clearly the intent of the decision was to encourage individuals to enter separation agreements. There was a clearly stated view by the Supreme Court of Canada that if individuals believe they have binding agreements, they are much more likely to have an incentive to enter into an agreement and not to litigate. And I think that's primarily a concern that men, assuming they are primarily the payors, are reluctant to enter into separation agreements if they're told by their lawyers, well, you can have a separation agreement settling this litigation, but it's not worth the paper it's written on because a court might just come along and vary it anyway. A man's going to say, well, why bother to have a separation agreement? So the Supreme Court is, if you want, trying to fight that, that belief and say men or payor spouses go out and make these agreements. They're going to be binding or nearly binding. Um, uh, the second decision, or the last decision that we'll be talking about is Richardson and Richardson. And this, if you want, was the most sympathetic fact situation for a spouse seeking to override uh, a support provision in a separation agreement. And in fact, it was the only one of the three cases to produce a dissent. Mr. Justice Lafaure dissented. Um, this case, I think, is significant because it, it shows how the Pellish test will be uh, interpreted or might be interpreted, and it shows that it is a strict test placing a real and heavy onus on the applicant. What happened in this case was the parties separated in 1979 after a 12-year marriage. During the last six years of that marriage, the woman was staying at home almost full-time to look after two young children. Prior to that time, she'd been working as a secretary and she was working during the marriage, but she stopped to look after the children. After the separation, um, the woman began a property and support application under Ontario's Family Law Reform Act. And in 1981, as a result of a courthouse negotiation, uh, an agreement was drafted and a separation agreement was entered into. That agreement gave each party custody of one of the two children and gave the woman $175 a month spousal support for one year only. It also provided $300 a month child support. Um, there was a property settlement which, at least as I read it, was not very advantageous to the woman. Um, it looked like she ended up assuming half of a debt of $20,000 which was owed to her parents. And I guess there was a question whether she'd actually pay it, but um, the husband took over the other half of that debt and another $10,000 in debt, so he took over $20,000 in debt, but he also got the $20,000 equity in the matrimonial home. In any event, it wasn't a great property settlement from her point of view. She signed uh, the separation agreement which contained a clause indicating that it was full and, and final and conclusive on all claims. In 1983, she was getting a divorce, and in the course of that divorce petition, she sought to vary the support provisions in the antecedent separation agreement. By that time, she was on welfare, and her husband continued to be employed throughout this. He was a member of the Ottawa Police Force, earning $40,000 a year. The trial judge gave the uh, woman $500 a month spousal support. In other words, he said, it's true you had nothing in the original agreement, now I'm giving you $500 a month. Kept the child support at $300 a month, giving her a total of $800 a month, and inserted a cost of living escalator saying, I don't want you to come back here every year. We know there's lots of inflation. Um, if there's a problem, someone can come back and, and get variation. The Ontario Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court of Canada disagreed with the trial judge and provided that there should be no spousal support but raise the child support from $300 a month to $500 a month and said there should not be an escalator clause. In the Supreme Court of Canada decision, Madam Justice Wilson wrote for uh, five uh, judges, as I say, ma uh, Mr. Justice Lafaure dissented. She ruled that the test uh, of for judicial involvement or overriding of a separation agreement 
uh, the test which she articulated in Pelesh, should apply whether the initial agreement was incorporated into a divorce decree and variation of a divorce decree was being sought. So that was the situation in Pelesh. That test should also apply even if the separation agreement was being directly incorporated into an original divorce decree. And if you want, there was an original application for support. That was the situation of Richardson. One of the arguments that was made there was, well, if you're varying an original order, maybe there's a different kind of test because after all there's already been a court order and here the divorce court is looking at the situation for the first time. The court said there is no difference really whether you're dealing with the issue as an original application or variation. In numerical terms, no difference whether you're under Section 11.1 or Section 11.2, the Old Divorce Act, or Section 15 or 17 of the New Divorce Act. So Madam Justice Wilson said in either situation you're applying the uh, test of Pelish, and she went on to ask whether there was a radical change in circumstances arising out of a pattern of economic uh, dependency generated by the marriage. The main issue which she seemed to focus on it, from a factual point was whether or not the woman's marketability, as she said, had been impaired or whether there had been an atrification of job skills as a result of being out of the labor force, as a result of the uh, roles assumed during the marriage. Uh, as, I, as you will recall, the woman had worked into the marriage, but for the last six years had only worked for four months. And Madam Justice Wilson asked herself, uh, was the woman's marketability or job skills affected as a result of being out of the labor force for those six years, staying at home to look after the two children? Well, the court concluded there was no impairment and no atrification of job skills. Uh, now, I wonder what the factual basis for that conclusion was, whether it was a question of judicial notice, whether Madam Justice Wilson was looking back over her own experience, which I'm not sure actually was that comparable. Um, I, I don't think that she was doing this on the basis of evidence. I'm not sure there was any evidence led about the question of atrification of uh, job skills or marketability, and when saying that, I in no way blame the counsel who was involved in that I presume that counsel who was arguing this at trial, or for that matter, at appeal, was unaware of the fact that it would be necessary to establish that there was an atrification of job skills or a loss of marketability, and so it's not surprising there was no evidence about that point. Um, in uh, his dissenting judgment, Mr. Lafferay took, uh, Mr. Justice Lafferay took a much more sympathetic approach to the woman's position. He noted that she was in her 40s, she had lost some of her job skills, and in particular she was in an area where there was changing technology, for example, now we have much more in the way of word processors and computers, so she in some way would have to be retrained. She was at home involved in childcare responsibilities, so Mr. Justice Lafferay thought that there was an actification of job skills and some kind of loss of marketability. I would uh, suggest that if the majority judgment had been written by a woman, there would have been a lot of criticism from uh, some of my feminist colleagues who would have said how insensitive of the Supreme Court, they don't realize what it's like to be a woman. I suspect that uh, since the majority was written by uh, a woman judge uh, herself, there was that kind of criticism was muted, but I think there has understandably been a certain amount of unhappiness uh, about some of the things that were said in Richardson and Richardson. Um, Madam Justice Wilson also went on to discuss whether there was a common expectation on the part of the parties that the woman would have employment at the end of one year. Um, although it wasn't clearly stated what the significance of the discussion of this common expectation discussion was, I think that they were getting at was there a radical change in circumstances. And don't forget the test for variation by the court was a radical change in circumstances attributable to roles assumed during the marriage. And the court seemed to say, well, maybe there wasn't much of a radical change in circumstances um, because it, it wasn't clear that the parties really expected her to get a job, although I'm sure the woman expected that she would have a job after a one-year time period. The Supreme Court went on to consider its jurisdiction to vary child support. And it's clear that when you're dealing with child support, there is a broader jurisdiction to vary uh, provisions found in a separation agreement. Uh, the court will protect the best interests of the child and here increase child support from $300 a month to $500 a month. I think that when one reads Richardson and Pellish, it's interesting to note that the Pellish case actually has a quite sensitive discussion about the difficulty of separating child and spousal support in that in practice you're giving the money to the custodial parent and you can't really benefit the child without benefiting the custodial parent. 
Um, however, in Richardson and Richardson, the court said these are child support and spousal support are conceptually distinct, and although the child should be protected, we're not going to do anything for the mother. Um, I think it's ironic that if Mrs. Richardson is on welfare in Ontario, it's my understanding that to increase the child support from $300 a month to $500 a month, in fact, does nothing for her. It only does something for the treasurer and taxpayers of Ontario because it means that her welfare is effectively reduced by that amount. Um, so I'm not sure why the court was so quick to uh, increase the, the child support, or at least why it was so concerned about the child. Uh, is, of course, if Mrs. Richardson ga becomes gainfully employed, the extra $200 will make a real difference to her. Um, I would say that while the courts are prepared to override child support provisions in a separation agreement, it's important to know that they will give considerable weight to those provisions. In other words, it's not as though a separation agreement dealing with child support um, is absolutely worthless. There are some cases that I talk about, refer to um, both Ontario decisions and other provinces that have said we will give considerable weight to child support provisions but less weight than to provisions dealing with spousal support. What's the overall effect of these uh, cases? I think one very clear message from a planning point of view is that the lawyer representing the dependent spouse in negotiating a separation agreement must be even more careful in terms of explaining the significance of the agreement, indicating that it's a final agreement, trying to avoid a quick decision by a spouse who may be under a lot of emotional stress. Um, a controversial aspect of what's the effect is the intent of the Supreme Court of Canada decision was to promote settlements. Some lawyers are arguing, no, there's going to be more litigation. And in particular, if you're representing a dependent spouse, particularly a woman, you're going to refuse to sign an agreement unless there's either a very generous settlement or a, a very open kind of variation clause. The argument going, one would prefer to have an order for spousal support made after a trial, which presumably is relatively easy to vary, rather than a separation agreement, which may be much harder to vary. Um, that's the argument. I suspect that the Supreme Court of Canada, in practice, uh, may be right, although I realize that there's little empirical evidence one way or another to support it. I think the fact that there is more certainty now should result in there being more agreements. I suspect that there may also be a greater tendency for payor spouses, typically men, to be a little bit more generous in making their offers knowing that they're binding. I think that there are a lot of men who are kind of reluctant to enter into a separation agreement when their lawyer says, you can sign this, but after all, she can just go back to court and open it up. Um, the fact that this is going to be a final settlement should encourage some men to be uh, somewhat more generous. I think finally, we're going to find that variation, even after an original court order, is not going to be that easy either. I think the general thrust of the decisions is to make all variation difficult, and so um, one may find that having a trial is not all that much more helpful. But that, that remains for the future to see. Clearly, if variation is going to be sought in a situation where there was a separation agreement dealing with support, there's a very heavy onus on the applicant. So if you're in that kind of situation, you're going to want to come to court with evidence presumably expert evidence, about labor market conditions, skill actification, all the things that the Supreme Court Canada talks about. Um, I think finally in terms of the effect of decisions, I've been focusing on the Divorce Act jurisdiction to vary. There is of course a jurisdiction under the Family Law Act, Section 33.4, uh, to vary spousal support also. I think clearly the Supreme Court of Canada decisions are going to be highly persuasive. Uh, there's going to be a tendency to want to have consistency. I think secondly, in a practical sense, it's important to know that um, really either spouse, and presumably typically it would be the man saying, I like that Supreme Court of Canada test of dealing with separation agreements, can force the issue to be dealt with under a divorce petition in the sense that you can launch a divorce petition now any time you want, uh, you don't have to even wait a year, you can file right away, have support effectively dealt with under the Divorce Act, and I think if you want, uh, that will be the standard uh, which because the doctrine of paramountcy will apply, they'll say we, if there's a, conf a conflict or a choice of legislation, we have to, to use the Divorce Act legislation because of paramountcy, and so the, the Divorce Act standard will tend to push out, if you want, the Family Law Act standard of Section 33.4. Um, the Supreme Court of Canada decision leaves many issues unresolved. For example, um, w should a court, when considering whether to override a separation agreement, take into account circumstances of formation? 
the decisions are a little bit unclear about that. I suspect that that will continue to be a factor. In other words, even if it's not unconscionable, if there was some bad situation going on that was less than unconscionable when the agreement was going on, the courts may look at that. Um, a second issue that's unresolved, what is the situation if, if the payor spouse wants downward variation, the web and web situation, saying there's been a radical change in circumstance, I can't pay what I promised to earlier on. Is that spouse going to have to show that that reversal was due to roles assumed during marriage? I think that's going to be almost impossible. I mean, typically, it's the man saying in the web and web situation, I promised to pay $3,000 a month. I can't because my business has gone really badly. I'm not sure one can link that to the marriage. I suspect the courts won't really um, require that. Uh, another issue that's unresolved, can the courts order escalator clauses? Um, can they have an inflation-adjusted support provision? There was some discussion about that issue in Richardson. Um, the court said we don't have to decide that here. Mr. Justice Lafaure, in, a, in my mind, an excellent dissent, at least on this issue, and a very cogent argument, said that it makes sense to have escalator clauses. After all, one can have that under provincial legislation. Um, if one's trying to get it under the Divorce Act, I think one should be looking at, at his dissent. There are some other issues. Um, I've used up my time, perhaps even I've used up a little bit of Phil Epstein's time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Bella. Our next speaker is Philip Epstein of Epstein Cole. <coughs> talk to you today about solicitor's liability and separation agreements. However, it occurs to me that before you go on to draft a separation agreement, it's important to know what your client's rights are, and therefore I'm going to just touch for a moment, although it's off topic, on a recent decision of Madam Justice Van Kant called Caratan, because I think it would be of significant interest to you. Ever since the passage of the Family Law Act, the battle has raged as to whether a professional license has any value. There's no doubt that it constitutes property, but as some judges have previously said in this jurisdiction and in other jurisdictions, most notably the United States, that although a professional license may be property, it has no value, primarily because it cannot be sold or transferred or dealt with as ordinary property is. That uh, kind of approach was taken in the decision called Corliss by Judge Steinberg, where the license in issue was a lawyer's license. No sooner did we think that issue was laid to rest that Madam Justice Van Camp has released a decision that has been under reserve for about a year and uh, only deals with Corliss in one line. Uh, Caratan um, may not be as important as it sounds because there may be good reason to doubt the correctness of the decision. However, it says this. In Caratan, Dr. Caratan was a dentist, and his wife had helped to put him through school. Following the American decision of O'Brien, Madam Justice Van Camp valued the license by determining what an honors graduate would earn against what a dental surgeon would earn, and she found that figure to be $219,000. Instead of then putting the $219,000 in the net family property category of the husband, she found that the wife had made a contribution to the acquisition of that property, therefore was entitled to an interest in that property by virtue of the doctrine of constructive trust, and therefore awarded the wife $30,000, which is a figure generally picked out of the air, against the $219,000 figure. The judgment is a mixture of a number of legal principles taken from various uh, different schools of thought and put together. It does not appear to be possible, to me at least, to value a license 
and then not put it in the net family property calculation because that's mandatory under the statute. However, it leaves Dr. Caritan in a very interesting appeal position. If he leaves it alone, he pays $30,000. If he appeals and the Court of Appeal agrees that it is uh, property and has value, then 219 goes into his NFP and he owes his wife another $109,000. So uh, we'll have to see what happens and uh, that case should be carefully looked at. Um, I leave it to you to decide uh, how, uh, how correct it may well be. Now, my paper on domestic contracts and lawyers' liability is very simplistic. It sets out a number of headings which ultimately match the checklist which you were given as a handout. Now, the reason it is simplistic is because, by and large, the insurer has been faced with claims that are all relatively simple. They amount to simple slips out of general clauses. But it would boggle one's mind how often these errors occur. And there has been an exceedingly dramatic rise in the number of solicitors' negligence claims against family lawyers in the last seven years. Eight years ago, there were none. Now, we are probably defending 10 or 15 at the moment, and there are uh, dozens of others. And it's therefore important to keep in mind that if you charge anywhere from $350 to $1,500 to do a separation agreement, and then you have to pay a deductible of $3,500 to $5,000, you can't solve the problem by volume. So let's turn to both the, the checklist and some of the clauses, and I'll give you some comments and tell you where lawyers have ended up paying their deductible. The first is really in the custody and access clause. This is a clause often done by rote without paying special attention to the terms. It's very important that you be precise. Of particular concern is change of name restriction. As most of you know, the Change of Name Act in a rather diabolical move by the government of Ontario, allowed the custodial parent to change the name of the child without the consent of the access parent. Now, this is what's known as the Spiteful Change of Name Act and has caused thousands of applications to be made to the registrar. What simply happens is the custodial parent applies to the registrar for the change of name. If there is access, the access parent must get notice but the access parent can't then do anything with that notice because there is no procedure to be taken before the registrar. All the access parent can then do is bring an injunction application to try to restrain that change of name. And in a recent case, Mr. Justice Eberly has decided that the court's jurisdiction to interfere with change of name has been largely ousted by the new legislation. <coughs> and accordingly, if your client really wants to get back uh, at his or her spouse, just have them change the child's name. I can't think of any particular reason for this legislation, and uh, I strongly urge you to take a look at it and write to your favorite uh, Liberal Member of Parliament. Um, the, there must be a clause, therefore, in the agreement restricting the change of name because the Act says that if there is a restriction in an agreement, then the court will not change the name. So that's absolutely of fundamental importance. Uh, you'll see some other ones listed there. Passport control, it may become very important in cases where you are concerned about uh, removal from the jurisdiction as to who has the right of the passport. And if you insert some clauses, the federal government will um, make an indication on their computer um, for separate passports. One of the oldest tricks for taking a child out of the jurisdiction was to take the passport then claim the passport was lost, get a second passport, and then surrender the first passport when you were required to do so, pursue it to a court order, and then take off on the second passport. The government has now amended their computer to pick that kind of thing up, and it's important that you put out an agreement, set out an agreement, who's going to be responsible for passports. The same thing applies with respect to removal of the jurisdiction. If there is no clause, then you can't lay an abduction charge and one of the values of, of, of having a removal from the jurisdiction clause is to not only try to keep your child here, but to make it possible in some occasions when there's been a violation of that clause to lay abduction proceedings under the criminal code. 
financial support clauses have uh, gotten people into a lot of difficulty because they tend to, on occasion, to be vague and imprecise in terms of uh, either a waiver of support or termination. Uh, you've heard from Professor Ballow this morning, Richardson, Pellock, and Karen have very significant implications for family law lawyers. You now, now must make it very clear in the agreement as to whether you intend to leave support open or not. If you intend to leave it open, then you have to consider putting back in the dollar a year that sort of has fallen by the wayside. If you intend to close it down, you'll see some other clauses that are going to be looked at today which will help you close down the support under any circumstances whatsoever. It's very important that you differentiate between spousal and child support. It is unusual, but nevertheless a frequent that we see agreements where there's just one support amount for the wife and the children, which leads to considerable litigation in the event that somebody's support is supposed to end. If you are having a termination clause, you have to be specific in terms of cohabitation, death, remarriage, whatever specific event you want, it's very important that you discuss with your client and decide what it means. If you're going to have support end upon cohabitation with another man, you have to decide whether you're going to say 30, 60, 90 days or until that person becomes a spouse or just exactly what you intend to do. An interesting uh, error, which has occurred more than once, is that the support clause will contain a termination clause. It will say January 1st, 1990, support for the wife or husband completely terminates under any circumstances whatsoever. And that will be a subclause as, as clause four in the agreement. And that will be 4C or 4D. When you then turn to the material change clause in the agreement, it says clauses three, four, and five are, are uh, subject to material change if there is a material change in circumstances. So you've got a variation clause of the termination clause which you didn't intend. And that's because when we tend to draft change of circumstance clause, we use the clause number rather than the subparagraph number. Please be sure that you don't end up having the termination date variable under the change of circumstance clause. If you intend to index the agreement, you should always have a schedule attached. There are continual fights as to what the indexing really meant. And it's important that you not index on a calendar date um, that the indexing is to match. In other words, if you're going to index on January 1st of each year, you can't because you don't know the January 1st indexing figure from CPI until March or April. So when you're indexing, you should at least pick a date which you're going to use as the calculation date that is at least three months before the date upon which the agreement is to be indexed. If you are intending to deal with educational expenses as part of the support arrangement, it's extremely important to break them down as to whether it means prior to post-secondary school or subsequent to post-secondary school. Medical and dental insurance clauses have given your insurer fits because people have not made sure that the agreement contains a clause that's enforceable. Often the agreement simply says that the husband will keep the wife insured. It doesn't provide for what happens if the insurance is not kept up and it does not provide any reasonable mechanism for the wife checking that the insurance is in place. I've considered over the years that frankly, although we all use the clause that the other spouse is to be responsible for OHIP and uh, other insurances, you're far better to try to restructure the agreement so that your own client, if possible, can pay the insurance. Because if the insurance uh, it lapses between the time of the claim and the time uh, you come along to enforce it, you've got a very serious problem. That is particularly so with life insurance. The life insurance clause must set out the policy, it must set out the policy number, it must set out when the premium is to be paid, and it must provide a mechanism to get the receipted premium into the spouse's hands that is to be protected. There's only a 30-day grace period on a life policy, so you must provide, if at all possible, that the premium notice goes to the person who is to be protected. Otherwise, the 30-day period goes by, the insurance lapses, your insurance clause may indicate that you have a claim against the estate, but if there's no assets in the estate, 
you've lost the insurance. So it must have a very careful mechanism for enforcement and you must tell your client that the client has an obligation each year to make sure that the insurance stays in force. You know, we tend to forget about these agreements. We draft them in 1987 and we assume our clients never die. But in about 20 years from now, a lot of our clients will start to die. And if we have the misfortune, or the other side will, will start to die, and if we have the misfortune of still being in practice, we're gonna have a host of clauses where there isn't insurance and there isn't proper protection. So it's very important to spell out in your reporting letter what the client must do each year to make sure that the insurance stays in force. The largest area of liability for lawyers and separation agreements has been over income tax, and it's been a basic failure to understand the income tax import of the agreement. Some uh, quick examples. Uh, dental practice, and the wife is the owner of the shares in the management company, and as part of the settlement, the wife is going to transfer the shares uh, to the husband. There are tax implications, particularly if the shares have gone up in value. Um, if the husband was in arrears of income tax, when he transferred capital property to the wife, the income tax department can pursue the property in the hands of the wife. There are a host of income tax problems, and the purpose of the paper and the talk is not to go through them, but to remind you that income tax is a significant problem, and you must be very careful when you go through all of the clauses of the agreement to make sure that you've covered them, particularly third-party payments. Now, there's a good deal of confusion in the law about third-party payments, but you can make them deductible if you use, and, and the, the course today will examine some of those clauses but you must use the right words, refer to the right sections, and you must be at even. You have to make sure that the parties understand who's going to pay the tax and who's not going to pay the tax. To have the husband agree with the wife that he'll pay for the summer camp for the children, or he'll pay half the summer camp for the children, have the husband then make the payment, the husband then claims that it's deductible, the wife then gets taxed, the wife has ended up paying for three quarters or seven-eighths of the camp instead of only half. So it's very important that there be some clarification between the parties as to what you intend with respect to third-party payments. The matrimonial home and the transfers of the matrimonial home provides an almost unlimited opportunity for negligence. In a recent case, the property was to be transferred from the husband to the wife. There was a legal aid, or it was thought to be that there was a legal aid lien against one of the parties. A legal aid lien does not show up in a title search. It shows up in a search in the sheriff's office. The search was not made in the sheriff's office. The property was, tra was uh, transferred. Now there is a significant battle between the husband and wife as to whether the wife is to take the property subject to the execution or the husband was to be responsible for the execution. It's very important, therefore, that in all cases dealing with matrimonial homes, you can't rely on your client as to title. The client may tell you the property's in joint, in joint tenancy. The client may tell you that he or she owns the property. Don't believe it. You've got to sub-search the property and ascertain the true state of title for yourself. And then you've got to be clear in the agreement as to what you're doing. If the husband is transferring the property to the wife free of encumbrances of any description, you have to say so. It's also important that you be careful about how you're dividing proceeds. There have been continual battles in Toronto and elsewhere over ambiguities arising out of the Division of Proceeds Clause. You can't tell from reading the agreement as to whether the debt's to come off the top or whether the debt's to come off the husband or wife share. And when you go look at the two lawyers' files, each has a different view of what was intended. What we often do in our office is we pass the agreement on to someone else to read so that we make sure that at least two people in the office think the agreement says the same thing. When you tend to read your own agreements, it tends to confirm what you think you've written and sometimes it has surprising results. Many agreements provide that as long as the parties, um, or as long as the wife is having exclusive possession, <coughs> the property will remain the principal residence. You have to be concerned about who's going to get the principal residence uh, exemption. It's a matter of some significance. You have to be very concerned about the Planning Act, which is something family lawyers never are. 
what happens is the husband and wife agree that the wife is to get title to the matrimonial home. Because it's a simple transaction, the family lawyer does the deed and registers it. But he does a sub-search to make sure that there are no executions and encumbrances, but he doesn't do a full 40-year search. It turns out that the conveyance from the husband, or from the original vendor to the husband and wife offended the Planning Act, and the conveyance from the wife to the husband or vice versa also offends the Planning Act, and you have a void deed. The client then says, well, well, you say to the client, well, you never instructed me to make a full search of title. And the client says, I don't know what a full search of title is. So how could I instruct you one way or the other? It's very important to explain to clients what this means. And it's far better if you're a family law specialist and you don't do real estate, send a real estate transaction out of the office, even if it's only a simple conveyance or a mortgage back, because you do run the risk that you can run afoul of some very interesting provisions in the fam in the uh, planning act. Now, my paper on uh, on solicitor's negligence contains a negligent error by me. Um, on top of uh, B12, there should have been a date inserted where it says recent decisions of Canada Pension Plan authorities seem to indicate that a general release will also be sufficient to release pension credits from division. That's true only to June 4th of 1986. After June 4th of 1986, you have to be specific or you will not have released Canada pension credits. Now, if you turn to page D100, you will see the specific clause that must be used after June 4th of 1986 to release Canada Pension credits. <coughs> the Act requires that you have both specific reference to the Act and specific reference to the sections. So you'll see the sections are set out. For those of you that have drafted separation agreements after June 4th, 1986, which simply said that Canada pension credits are not to be divided and the parties release each other from all claims, those releases are ineffective. I don't suggest however you report to your insurer yet, um, but uh, there is unfortunately some significant risk that that kind of clause has not affected a release of Canada pension credits. Which brings me to the release clauses. There have been a host of claims against the insurer because the agreement contained no release. Now, generally this occurred when parties signed minutes of settlement at the courthouse steps. And what they did in the minutes of settlement is set out all the terms of their settlement, but they forgot to include a general release clause or a specific release clause. It's extremely important that when you ever go to a, to a pretrial or a trial where you think there might be a settlement, take along a checklist because the checklist will help you go through all of the items that should be canvassed in the minutes of settlement, most particularly a release clause. It would also boggle your mind to know that there have been a significant number of marriage contracts entered into between the parties which contain no release clause whatsoever. And it's very hard to then figure out what the parties really intended. If you intend the agreement to bind the estate of the parties, obviously you must say so. And if you intend for the parties to give the property back or to have a different regime or a different result, you've got to provide what happens upon reconciliation. No matter how bitter the dispute seems to be, it's very important that you have a clause that decides what you're going to do. Otherwise, you end up with the following interesting scenario. A husband settles with his wife by way of separation agreement and out of feelings of guilt or otherwise, he gives her far more than he intended. She ends up with the house and the cottage and he walks away from the scene. The wife has the house and cottage and then the parties reconcile and they separate six months later. Does the wife keep the, the house and cottage and even if she keeps them, do they form part of her NFP for the purposes of the new calculation or do you want any property transferred under the separation agreement to be excluded from the NFP the second time around. 
you have to consider what you intend to do about those kinds of problems. Now, let me touch briefly on marriage contracts, which will be the major source of business for solicitor negligence insurers over the next uh, decade. These are, as you know, very difficult contracts to draft. The parties are trying not to be in an adversary position. They're all walking on eggs in an attempt not to upset each other, and yet they want to protect certain kinds of property. The common occurrence is when both clients come to a lawyer that they know, and they want to discuss with that lawyer a marriage contract and have him draft it. Now, no matter how many times we have said both in the bar admission course and at these kinds of lectures that you cannot act for both sides, including representing both sides in a marriage contract, there are a considerable number of claims against lawyers because they attempted to represent both sides. Or they got caught in a situation where it looked like they were representing both sides. And how does that occur? Well, the lawyer acts for one side, and the other side comes into the lawyer's office to sign the agreement. When a problem arises out of the agreement later, the client that was unrepresented claims that he thought the lawyer was representing him or her as well. And then there's an immediate credibility gap. Now, it is also pointless to send the client down the hall to the other side to get independent legal advice. And if you're asked to do that, you want always to refuse. The insurer has recently paid $35,000 on a claim arising out of negligent independent legal advice. The client went down the hall and to another office and saw a lawyer for 10 minutes. Four years later, a claim arose. The lawyer had no file could not recognize the client, had no memory whatever of the transaction, but the client testified that she paid the lawyer $10, and the $10 was not put through the lawyer's trust account or general account. <laughs> that is the kind of embarrassing scenario that um, can occur when you agree to represent one side and give them independent legal advice. If you're going to do give independent legal advice in one of these contracts, you have to know certain things. You have to know the financial position of the parties. You have to know the, your client well enough to know whether there's any pressure being <coughs> asserted to get the contract. You have to know a great deal about the circumstances, and you can't do that for $25 or $50 or whatever the suggested fee is going to be for independent legal advice. And since independent legal advice can subsequently lead to your involvement in a lawsuit or the loss of your deductible, my advice is that you not agree to represent someone for independent legal advice in a marriage contract unless it's a full retainer requiring you to properly investigate all aspects of the matter. Now that brings us to the area of disclosure. It's quite common that people do not want to disclose financially for the purposes of a marriage contract. And we quite, quite, quite frequently see in, in these contracts lines to the effect that the parties waive financial disclosure or are satisfied with the disclosure made. You can't waive financial disclosure in a marriage contract because the Act says you can't waive it. And therefore, it's incumbent upon you to have some financial disclosure or the agreement may be totally invalid. And you have to tell your clients who say, I don't want to tell my spouse what I've got. He may then be marrying me for my money. Uh, nevertheless, you have to find some way of making disclosure. Disclosure it doesn't perhaps have to be as detailed as a financial statement, but it does have to give the other side a fair indication of the assets and liabilities of the parties. When dealing with a marriage contract, quite frequently the agreement is drafted to indicate what property each party will own, and that there will be no division of property in the sense that each won't have a claim on the other's property. That does not take the agreement far enough, and you have to have reference in a marriage contract to net family property and the scheme of the Act. If the agreement fails to include a provision that the property owned by a spouse will not be included in the net family property, you have the opposite result of what you intended. You'll have your client owning the property the client wanted to own, that it will all form part of his or her net family property and subject to, to therefore division. There are a series of marital contracts that we have seen that deal with the matrimonial home in great detail. 
they fail to deal with a successor home. It's very important that if you're going to deal with a matrimonial home, and who get, gets what out of it and how it's divided, that you make sure that you contemplate what happens when the parties go on to sell that home and acquire another home. There is a significant difference between a marriage breaking down by reason of irreconcilable differences and a marriage terminating by death. Many marriage contracts have failed to deal with death and you obviously will, will want, in most cases, a different result on death while the parties were cohabiting than you will want upon simple breakdown of marriage. It is very common these days for clients to ask you to do an agreement that is entirely separate as to property and entirely separate as to support, what I call the, the get nothing, give nothing agreement. The usual scenario is that the husband has a career and the wife has a career and they both intend to pursue their careers and they have not considered uh, either the implications of children or they don't plan to have children. They wish to pursue these careers independently and therefore they ask you to draft a contract that provides that upon breakdown of marriage or cohabitation, they're completely separate as to property, there'll be no sharing under the Family Law Act, and there'll be no support. These agreements, in our view, are an invitation to a lawsuit. If they are drafted that way, they will probably withstand any attack in light of the decisions in Richardson and Pellick, save and accept the support provisions, because if the, the circumstances arise where the support provisions become unconscionable, then there may be relief open to the spouse that becomes dependent. But I ask you, in every case in which you're doing a marriage contract, and these parties are sitting there uh, with perhaps stars in their eyes and, and uh, planning to get married a week or two weeks from now, they always seem to retain you a day before the marriage, is ask yourself, What's going to happen to this couple 10 or 20 years from now? What happens if the wife uh, decides to uh, have three children and decides not to go back to pursue a career, decides to be a homemaker, and 20 years later the children are grown up, the husband has now built up a substantial business and now wishes to separate from his wife. He pulls a contract out of the drawer that no one has seen for 20 years and the wife has no interest in property whatsoever. It strikes me that those uh, kinds of agreements are fraught with difficulty and it's the practice of our office not to act for um, potential dependent spouses who might well find themselves in that position. I think there is some obligation on a lawyer to not only protect his client, but protect himself. And if you get in the practice of drafting agreements that, that both get nothing and give nothing, those agreements will come back to haunt you. And I think you should steer clear of them and have nothing to do with them. They are not generally sensible for the parties because they do not contemplate the future. Sometimes these agreements uh, would be far better off with a sunset provision if they expire or have to be renegotiated. Since that is difficult to, to do and most unlikely, my advice is to be very careful of those kinds of agreements. The vast majority of claims against lawyers in the family law area have arisen over mixed up instructions. The lawyer, some three or four years later, says this is what the client had in mind, and the client says something differently. It's the only file the client has ever had, and for the lawyer, it's the 1,000th file. The credibility gap between the lawyer and the client is usually significant, and it's no contest for the client to win over the lawyer who can't simply remember. The moral of all this is that you must have a documented file. If lawyers would do things in writing, we would eliminate about 75% of the potential claims. The simple fact is that we don't take instructions in writing, and we don't take a minute uh, or two to protect ourselves. You have to know that when clients become unhappy about these agreements, they first turn to their spouse to see if they can upset the agreement. And they learn from the Supreme Court of Canada that they can't upset the agreement they then turn to the lawyer who drafted it. And it's incumbent upon lawyers to be aware that in a rising uh, time of increased solicitor's negligence claims, that you have a duty and an obligation to protect yourself. Thank you very much.
presentation will be moderated by Nancy Mossop. Nancy was called to the bar in 1979, and she practices in Mississauga. Her practice is restricted to family law and divorce. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, this is uh, the first of the panel uh, discussions on separation agreements and precedent clauses that um, you might be interested in including in your agreements. Uh, to help you in um, organizing how the panels are running, we will be referring to the precedent agreement that you'll see starting at pay, uh, C, section C. And if you uh, would like, it might be helpful to take that whole uh, precedent separation agreement out and have it uh, as a reference for the panelists when they would be re referring to that. What the panelists have done in their individual uh, papers is critique that precedent, which is actually, a, a, I believe, the Bard Mission Course precedent, and it has been used in other uh, law society programs. Um, so they have critiqued some of the existing clauses in their particular topics, and then they have uh, provided some. Um, alternative clauses that you might be interested in uh, putting it under the particular sections. The first um, panel this morning is uh, my panel members on my right is Susan Lang, a barrister and solicitor in Toronto who was called to the bar in 1976 and whose practice in Toronto is restricted to family law. On my far left is Harold Nyman, um, who graduated from Osgoode Hall in 1974. He's a partner in the law firm of Abraham Duke and Hope uh, Nyman and Stott in Toronto, and his practice is also restricted to family law. Um, Yolanta Lewis, uh, sitting beside me, was called to the bar in 1979. She's a partner in Dunbar Sachs Appell, and her practice is also restricted to family law. Um, I will be directing certain questions to the uh, panelists uh, on in their areas of um, expertise. Susan Lang has uh, uh, completed the paper on custody and access problems, Yolanta on support, and uh, Harold on uh, material change and circumstance clauses and uh, releases. Uh, they will also be commenting um, on the other particular panelists' uh, uh, questions if they, uh, if they feel that they have something to add. Um, I'm going to start off with Susan then in the custody and access area and we'll uh, start with the clause that we probably put in all our agreements. Um, that is, the wife shall have custody of the children of, and the husband will have liberal access. What's the matter with that, Susan? Well, that provision, Nancy, can you hear me? Is this mic working? That provision may work in some instances, but for example, in a recent uh, separation agreement we were negotiating, we went through weeks and weeks of, of arguing about what access and what provisions should go in the custody and access portion of the separation agreement. And at the end of it, we had about two and a half pages on custody and access. My client came in to review it for the final time and said she had read her neighbor's separation agreement and it was just expressed so elegantly and so simply in hers when it had this provision in it. And uh, so I said, and couldn't we do this in her agreement? And I asked her what she thought that provision meant. And she said, well, it means I get custody, I get to choose everything with respect to the child, and my husband may see the child when I decide. Um, and that's basically what's wrong with the provision in my view. It, it's just too open to confusion. And unless you have a case where the custody parent is the primary parent and the only parent, then you probably are going to have significant problems with it. You really need to be more specific on a number of issues, and I've listed them in my paper in great detail, but basically you would generally speaking want to have a little more on access, specifically what you mean about access. Most agreements these days have a consultation provision in them, even in a non-joint custody situation. You'd want to deal with the specifics of that. You'd want to deal with some matters that Phil Epstein touched on and which we'll be touching on again, but on the passport issue, on the change of name issue, and also various other provisions that we will deal with. So by and large, I would not recommend this provision 
in a separation agreement. Okay, if you're including, um, uh, you want to add something about specific about access, then uh, depending on the parties, and I know it varies from agreement to agreement, but, uh, and you have referred to some in your precedent, what, what kinds of access uh, stipulations do you put into your u agreements usually? Well, generally we put in specifics as to weekend access. Usually we extend it to Monday night, for example, if there's a long weekend. Often we will include the Friday if it's a professional development day and, and that's satisfactory to the parents. We'll talk about notice provisions if those are relevant for the particular access. Some clients have very serious concerns about access and they want it stipulated, for example, that the access parent um, will ensure the children have seat belts, will not drink during access, various other things. You usually also get the question about whether or not the girlfriend or the boyfriend can be present during access, which most of us feel is inappropriate and we don't touch on that, but various people do want to go into the issue of um, vacation time with the children and if you're specifying, for example, two weeks vacation in the summer, then you should be careful to include the weekends on either side of that if that's what your client thinks is happening. And again, the same thing with, with spring vacation, that you include both weekends if, if that's what you intend. And really get down into the very specifics of it. I think that's a good point on the summer vacation. I'm sure uh, all of you have experienced the problems when we simply put in two weeks during the summer for the access parent. Uh, you get called about what, what other weekends that access parent might be entitled to for the summer. You also get called by the custodial parent who doesn't have two weeks of uninterrupted access and, and they have to give up a weekend in the middle. So I, I think your point is well taken there. I, I think that is very important, Nancy. I mean, we haven't traditionally, that's not been in separation agreements, but more and more often for some reason you seem to get called from the other parents saying, but what about two uninterrupted weeks for me, or what, whatever the case is. And then you may also, on vacation, want to specify that the other parent will be on vacation themselves while they're exercising access, that it won't be left to a caregiver other than the parent. <coughs> and also, with respect to infant access, I think that you want to provide, if you can, for graduated access. If you're talking about a very young infant, then often it's obviously inappropriate to have alternate weekends. You'd have more frequent access of shorter duration, but you would, if you could, I think, specify that unless there's a change in circumstances, that that access will increase as follows, including summer access. Uh, do you ever put in something uh, with respect to if, a par if the custodial parent uh, requires babysitting, that the um, other parent may have the first option to be the babysitter? Do you ever put that in? Well, I put it in sometimes, but very reluctantly, because that can always lead to great difficulties. W one of the other things that we have put in, though, in terms of the other way around, is, is if the father or the mother is to exercise access on alternate weekends and then fails to do so. In one agreement, we very successfully put in a financial provision. It's not a fine per se, but the mother, in that case, would have to have arranged alternative babysitting because she worked on those alternate weekends. So that if the father fails to exercise that access, we put in that he had to pay $40 a day, which is what it was going to cost her to get an alternative caregiver for that period of time. Now that I don't think always works, but it can work fairly successfully in ensuring regular access. They should have had you when they were doing the enforcement uh, provisions of custody, Susan. Um, okay, I'll come back to you dealing with the joint custody uh, provisions, and I want to talk a bit about that, but I'm going to move on to Yolanta, who uh, her emphasis is in the support aspects of uh, our separation agreements. And um, as Phil has mentioned, this is going to be um, Phil is always so uh, depressing to listen to. He always tells us what we're going to be sued for. And uh, probably uh, support provisions. Uh, he's good, but he's depressing. Um, and uh, uh, dealing with that, and also what Nick has talked about in the cases that have come out of the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, what types of events, Yolanta, do you put into your separation agreement, uh, particularly triggering the um, ceasing of a uh, spousal support and what should we be careful about in that regard? Um, I think that there are a lot of excuse me, I think that there are a lot of difficulties with the precedent clause in the agreement because it seems to cover such a broad catch-all of categories and only one of them, the wife attaining full-time employment, uh, deals specifically with uh, the wife attaining some form of self I think there's some concern as well that if the intention is to ensure that the wife is in fact self-sufficient at the time that the support is being terminated, 
it would make much more sense to have the termination date tied to either the wife attaining a specific level of income before the support ceases, or alternatively, have some provision that she would maintain that employment for a certain period of time before the support would be cut off. This at least would be a means of allowing some form of grace period or uh, time for the wife to ensure that she's going to be able to maintain that employment. The other criticisms that I have with respect to the precedent clause are some of the criteria which are specified for termination of support really don't seem to bear any relation to a reason for spousal support terminating. For example, the child leaving the home or the sale of the matrimonial home. So I can think of very few circumstances in which these would be sort of a standard clause as part of a termination clause for support. Okay, and um, another one that is traditionally included, and I, um, I'm, I certainly put it into most of my agreements, is when the, the spousal support is cut off for remarriage or uh, cohabitation of some degree, usually defined as in the Family Law Act. Is there any way that we could put into our agreement some way to protect a, a receiving spouse uh, who might have a short liaison, uh, have her support cut off, and then still be totally dependent um, afterwards? Particularly, I'm thinking of an older woman who might have had a lengthy marriage where she was um, in the home the entire time. Have you ever put any clauses in that might protect uh, that spouse? There are two alternate clauses uh, included with my material that might assist a receiving spouse in that kind of situation. Uh, one of the clauses puts the termination of support only if the spouse cohabits in relationship uh, to, for the length of time that she's able to establish a support claim against her new common law spouse. So it's specifically tied to the, uh, the definition of uh, a spouse, dependent spouse in the family law. The other alternative clause deals with the right of a husband to bring a variation application if the wife is cohabiting, and this is in a situation where the period of cohabitation may not be specified, and in that situation, the onus would be on the husband to establish that the support should cease, and presumably if evidence were, was called with respect to the nature of the wife's new relationship and the fact that there wasn't any financial inter interdependence, it may be a means for support to continue. I think the major disadvantage of that kind of arrangement is that if there is a dispute over whether or not the support is going to terminate at some point after a period of cohabitation, the resolution may only be made in the courts as opposed to outside the courts, and that would be one of the major reasons you want a separation agreement is to avoid having to go to court. So certainly I think one way of resolving it is to make it very specific, the length of cohabitation which is going to trigger a termination, and it may also be necessary to put in a specific clause that uh, support would not, for example, would not resume even if the relationship terminated, say after three months. Susan, did you want to comment on that aspect? I just wanted to comment on, on the changing values that we all have with respect to this issue and the feeling that if a woman has been in a long-term relationship for 20 or 25 years, then she has foregone a lot of career potential and to query whether or not putting in even the three-year limitation is appropriate. She's not, just because she's living with somebody else, going to be career retrained after the three-year period. And I think you really, I'd like to see agreements more tied to financial independence rather than cohabitation. And if you are going to use the term cohabit, then I would suggest that it should be defined quite clearly at the beginning of the agreement. Yes. I, I just wanted to add uh, one other point on cohabitation, termination clauses. I think that that was much more frequent uh, years ago that we would put in a cohabitation termination date for support. But these days, quite frequently, I'm confronted by a wife who, whose husband perhaps is living with somebody else who will say to me, if I have to stop receiving support if I'm living with somebody. Why is that fair, given the fact that my husband is living with somebody? And that's not relevant. And the other part of it is, if you have a, say, a 90-day cohabitation clause, and the parties just split up on the 89th day, and then resume cohabiting on the 92nd day, does that then terminate the support? And what you might want to do is put in a cumulative period uh, with one particular person to cover that eventuality. Okay, and um, one other question, Yolanta, for you right now is on, what about on the method of payment of um, the support? Do you deal with that in your agreements usually? 
I will, I will usually deal with it um, to provide for payments by post-dated check simply because I think it goes to being the most convenient method of payment both for the payer spouse and the receiving spouse so that she ensures she has a regular series of checks. Uh, the other alternative that I've sometimes provided for where the parties are both in agreement with that kind of method is to have payments made by automatic transfer to the wife's bank account. For example, if they're living in uh, others, you know, in another city, at least this way is a, is a means of the wife ensuring that she's going to get the, the support into her bank account on the first day of the month. When, if you put in that provision, do you also then ask in the agreement that uh, the, pay, the payee opt out of the SCOE program or that she will not use the SCOE program? I don't think that that would be fair to the wife because I can think of numerous situations where problems might arise in enforcement of payments and it would not seem equitable that the wife, as a condition of getting post-dated checks, uh, have to give up her right to enforce. Susan, do you have a comment? Well, we went through this one a couple of weeks ago and I don't guarantee what I'm about to say is, is right, but I certainly think it's worth checking out. My understanding is that that new provision must now go in all judgments and orders so that you have to be in the SCOE program. Now we talked to them about opting out and they told us that if you opt out initially, then if there's a later default, you cannot opt back in. So, however, they're reconsidering that, I understand, and they're going to consider accepting a notice provision whereby you, you can file a notice of withdrawal, but it's conditional upon no default, and once there is a default, then you can opt back in. So when you're doing these things, I would just suggest that you call the SCOE program until it's, it's clearer what's happening and make sure that you're doing it so that you're not prejudicing your client. I got uh, the opposite advice when I called them a few weeks well, ago. Well, there you go. Well, they're new, eh? So you have to, you they're have just, to they're it. still feeling, uh, I think the safest is, and that's not, that is not how I did my notices initially, but I'm doing them now, is to put in that you're withdrawing until default and then you wish to, um, and at that point you wish to be able to opt back in. I think it might not be safe to just have a complete withdrawal from the program. Okay, um, Harold. Uh, the famous material change in circumstance clauses and uh, dealing with releases. Um, what's, what's wrong with that uh, nice standard material change in circumstance clause and the precedent that I've been using for years? There's, a, there's nothing terribly wrong with it, otherwise it wouldn't be in the bar admission course materials. <laughs> but the, prob the problem really is that it's too general. And I think as uh, Professor Bala and Phil Epstein have already pointed out, these type of clauses are even more important in light of the Supreme Court of Canada decisions. I think what's important is that the parties direct their minds as to what provisions of the agreement can be changed, i.e. custody, access, support, support for children. Those are general areas of, of the agreement that can be varied. And then to set out the circumstances that can give rise to a variation. That would obviously assist the court in determining whether there's material change. But also, I think more importantly, it would force the parties to, to have to deal with that issue straight out. That would be things such as uh, employment, income, remarriage, cohabitation, some of the other issues that have been uh, discussed earlier today. Sometimes the purpose of support is to enable a party to, to get started, to get back on their feet and the recipient wants to be able to receive a certain amount of support in addition to anticipated income. You don't want to find yourself in a position where after the person starts to receive income of some sort that the payor brings an application to vary. In the material that, 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 that I prepared, I've, I've inserted the type of clause which might be useful in those circumstances, which deals with a certain level of income that will be deemed not to be a material change in circumstances. Having done that, you then ask yourself the question, well, what happens if the payee does not receive any income? Can she get it both ways? And I'm assuming that it's the woman in this situation. So you have to deal with the obverse situation as well, which is that if the payee is not receiving any income, that is not going to be a material change in circumstances to enable her to seek a variation of support upwards. The important things, I think, are to set out in the agreement the basis of the, the agreement, the bargain, bearing in mind that the Supreme Court of Canada has said what they will do is enforce the bargain, and the bargain should be spelled out in the agreement. Um, in listing specific circumstances, which um, uh, your precedent is very good on actually specifying uh, 
in uh, giving some examples of those. Uh, how do you protect yourself or do you concern yourself that if you list those circumstances and something unusual comes up or something unexpected, um, you might be barred from trying to raise that as a material change in circumstances? Oh. I think, firstly, it, it may be that the parties have decided that they do not want any of the provisions to be buried. That could be the first consideration, uh, as in Webb. Assuming that the parties have agreed that there, that there can be circumstances which justify a variation, you, I would think, simply say that, that it's not limiting the generality of the, the, uh, the clause allowing for the variation and then listing certain factors which permit the, the automatic triggering of the variation, such as cohabitation or earning income. It could be that you've negotiated an agreement which was based upon the fact that the wife is not going to be earning any income. You may want to include in the material change in circumstances clause the fact that if the wife receives any income, that is going to be material change. During the course of negotiating any agreement, you have arguments back and forth as to whether a woman uh, who say 55 or 60 been out of the workforce is going to require full support from the husband and the husband is saying no she can go out to work and the wife is saying no I don't intend to work I need three thousand dollars a month because that's how much I need to, to live on I think at that point in time you'd be quite justified in putting into the material change and circumstances clause a provision that if the wife receives any income at all that will be deemed to be material change in circumstances what about including these did you want to comment? Okay, just, what about including these material change in circumstance clauses in your judgments or court orders? Uh, you, you've mentioned to me that you have a problem in Peel, uh, also dealing with material change in circumstances, uh, apart, apart in from orders. a general problem yeah. in Peel. Uh, the, including, <laughs> including it in, in an order, uh, I haven't had that as a problem uh, in, in Toronto. I don't see that that, that, that should represent a problem. Uh, there is the practice direction of Justice Walsh which indicates that in divorce judgments uh, you can include just about everything except for releases and the release clauses can be dealt with in the preamble to the divorce judgment and presumably the, the, the Family Law Act judgment. Okay, Elanta, did you want to comment on that? Yes, uh, just in addition to Harold's point, uh, it might be appropriate in a, in a material change of circumstances clause or somewhere in an agreement where uh, the wife earning some income is going to be a circumstance to trigger a material change in circumstances clause that there should be a requirement that she provide her husband with uh, copies of her income tax returns. Otherwise, he may not know that he's going to be able to rely on that provision. You also, Harold, had an interesting circumstance that might justify a material change in circumstances, and that was the um, uh, birth of a child by the payor. I, I wondered if you've ever been able to get anybody to sign an agreement where that might be deemed to be a material change in circumstance. No, but Do I, you know I, something I don't know no, about? No, but I can, I can now refer to precedent material as, as being uh, some reason for uh, getting that clause in. Uh, the, the, <laughs> the Law the, Society notes done by right. you. I see. The, 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 you know, there's this whole, I guess, argument, polemic, dealing with the, the second family. And uh, I know Madam Justice uh, Wilson wrote an article about this and encouraging this, the, the second family and the balancing of the rights of the second family against the obligations of the first, the first family. And uh, it seems to me that that, that obviously is, is a, a material change in circumstances. And if not, it's something that should be on the table, I would think, at the time of the negotiation of the agreement. Otherwise, what you're doing is you're just burying your head in the sand and uh, eventually it's going to come up and better that you have it in the agreement and then the court can look at it later on when, when the time comes. Uh, with respect, don't ever let Harold Nyman let you have that in your agreement. <laughs> um, I'm only teasing you, Harold. I just don't think it's a material change in circumstances that would ever warrant. Okay, going back to the um, custody and access. Uh, Susan, the issue of joint custody is becoming more and more in vogue in our family law areas and um, particularly with respect to separation agreements we often um, find ourselves negotiating around the terms of um, joint custody. What kinds of things do you usually include in these agreements and um, what do you do about enforceability of some of the provisions that uh, may be a little ambiguous? Well, with respect to joint custody, you'd have a lot of the same provisions that you have in an ordinary custody provision, but I think it's important particularly that you define what you mean by joint custody. Our clients, uh, again, have very different views on what they mean by it, 
And so you have to talk about whether you're really talking about shared parenting and consultation, whether you're talking about both of you having substantial periods of time with the children, precisely what you mean. But I think the most important aspect of the joint custody situation, as well as the custody situation, is a consultation provision setting out what it is the parties have to consult about. And if there are specific concerns, whether it be on education, private school versus public school, religious training, any of those elements, then I, then I think it's probably better to specify them. Then you have to talk about how you resolve them when you can't agree. And presumably you would go a mediation route, or at least you'd put that into your agreement, um, hoping to be able to resolve it in that manner. Other precedents say what you do is you consult an expert in the area of disagreement. And some agreements say you're bound by the opinion of that expert. I've never had a client who's prepared to do that myself because they tend to feel that the parents are better able to make these decisions than the expert, even though they might take the expert's advice into consideration. And then that clause would go on to say what would happen if you're still at a stalemate, and usually it's an application to a court to determine the issue. I think you can probably, now I think there's some disagreement on this, but I think you can probably bypass the mediation and negotiation route and go straight to court, no matter what the agreement says. And most of the provisions that I draft say that you can do that, particularly if it's a matter of some urgency, so that you don't have to go that route. But I think it is important to have a really serious consultation provision in. Harold's dying to say yeah, something. I, I just wanted to, to, to ask a question. Presumably that would, might deal with a situation such as uh, extracurricular activities or something of that nature where the parties can't reach agreement and then you have provision for mediation. I don't think that it's uh, sensible to bring an application to a court, to a judge to decide issues of that kind. I would think that it, that it would be preferable in the agreement that you decide who's going to make those decisions. Provide for mediation, provide for, for conferring, that doesn't hurt. But I, I don't think it makes uh, a great deal of sense to provide for the parties to be able to apply to a court, especially uh, in family law motions court, uh, to have to make that kind of decision. Harold promised me a trick question, although that one doesn't seem to be all that tricky, so I'm waiting for the next one. But um, as far as that's concerned, I, I think you're right. I mean, if we can encourage resolution of these issues by mediation, that's fine. But I disagree with you, I think, on, on trying to negotiate who should have the final decision. That's exactly where negotiation often falls down. And if you try to negotiate that, you may lose the concept of joint custody altogether, and you may end up in an assessment litigation situation. I mean, I think it is important, and if you can do it and agree, fine. But if you can't, I don't have any difficulty, particularly with narrow issues like private school versus public school, in trying to get a resolution if and when they come up, rather than blowing the whole settlement at that time. But I do agree it's more costly if you have to come back to court, obviously, emotionally and financially. Um, I think what this discussion also brings up is that uh, often in a joint custody agreement we'll see paragraphs that uh, the parties will consult with respect to major issues affecting the welfare of the children. I think what Susan's trying to highlight too is that we should specify those which there is to be consultation about affecting the, major, the welfare of the child and those which there are, are not. The, the kind of toothpaste they use is probably not a matter that affects the major welfare that we want to discuss, but listing them, which I have not done often, is, is a really good idea. I tend to agree with Susan as well that if you give a uh, last resort power to one of the parents, it will probably be used at times to negate the consultation process and should be used uh, with caution. Well, often, Nancy, too, we put in that, that the parent who has the children at the particular time, if you've got a, a primary residence and a secondary residence, and that parent will make the decisions with respect to the day-to-day -day care of the children while they're with them, so you don't get into the type of, type of toothpaste argument. And whether it's joint custody or, or custody, I also, if there's going to be a problem, try to put into an agreement that one parent will not arrange activities for the children, which is going to impinge on the time that the children spend with the other parent, so that you don't have the situation, which I had recently, where the one parent puts activities down on the very weekends that the other parent is supposed to be seeing the children. I think that's a good point, too, because that's something in practice that we probably don't think about, but which comes up all the time. Um, another uh, question that's um, come up, I think, for all of us is, what do you do about the wishes of the children, especially as they get older? Have you ever put in anything in your agreements regarding either access or, such as you're talking about, extracurricular activities, where it is specifically said in the agreement that the wishes of the children either will prevail or will be considered, that sort of thing? I don't think I've ever said that the wishes of the children will prevail, but on occasion I've certainly said that they will be given great weight or taken into consideration 
or that one parent will be sensitive to the wishes of the children, either with regard to access or to activities. But I hate to put the full burden on the children of making that type of decision, no matter what their age. And I certainly would never put it in for a very young child. But for a teenage child, I mean, frankly, they're going to make the decisions in the long term anyway. Okay, and another question in this area, because I think it's important, is what do you do about uh, the removal of children uh, from jurisdictions, and how narrow uh, do you ever put in a, a, a residence change uh, jurisdictional clause? Do you have any concerns about those? Well, it's, it's often a very difficult area, and I find it's one more and more with the recent case law that, that you really do have to negotiate at the time you're, you're settling the separation agreement. It's to be distinguished from the clause where you say whether or not a parent can take the child out of the jurisdiction for vacation. We're talking about somebody actually moving the primary residence of the child so that, if you will, the secondary parent uh, will not have as much access. And generally, I've been putting in on those, I mean, you try to negotiate, depending who you're acting for, either that they can do so or they cannot do so. And, and then you try to have some method of resolution if they, if they can agree upon one, and again, you go the mediation, et cetera, route. Now, if there's going to be a real disagreement and you know it's upcoming, then sometimes I'm much more specific and say that if it happens, the parties will immediately go to an assessment uh, before any litigation, and once the assessment is over, and they have not yet reached an agreement, then I even put down very great specifics on how any litigation will proceed, so that it will be in the shortest possible time frame, and the one parent won't be trying to stall it, just to hope that the whole thing will go away and there will be no move feasible. Um, the, other, the other method of resolving it, which is also quite successful, is to take a leaf out of the new Divorce Act, and instead of making a decision about it right then and there, just say that if one parent is intending to move, then the other parent must give 90 or 120 days notice, whatever you feel is appropriate, if they are intending to move, and then they can move unless the other parent brings an application to try to stop them. And, and then people can decide at that time. Those various jurisdictional clauses are in your precedence, too, yes. I understand. Okay, Yolanta, dealing with um, the issue of child support, uh, again, the precedent talks about an age cutoff, and um, I know in your alternative clauses you deal a bit with that. What's, what is the concern about um, an age of 21 as a cutoff? There are often situations that arise that have been dealt with uh, in some of the cases where a child's education might be interrupted, and then there is some concern about whether the obligation for support is going to resume when the child goes back to school. And I'm finding more and more frequently, rather than putting in a specific age cutoff, I'm tying the termination of child support to the child completing an undergraduate degree at a post-secondary educational institution. Uh, one thing about that kind of support clause, though, is often it has to also be tied to what provision the parties are making or might be making in their agreement with respect to the re uh, responsibility for payment of post-secondary educational costs. In some cases, I've had clients who want support to be paid to the wife during the time that the child is in high school, but at the time a decision is made as to whether the child is going to be continuing on to university and going away to residence, they feel that that is uh, something that should trigger a material change in circumstances clause, which should reopen the issue of support and also tie it to the amount that the parent is going to be paying with respect to the post-secondary -sec educational costs. In your uh, paragraph then dealing with educational expenses or post-secondary, um, would you, would you in include a separate provision then dealing with those costs and have the support payable as well, generally? I think it really depends on the circumstances. I think because, uh, particularly if a child is going to be going away to residence, that is going to significantly affect the costs that are going to be borne by the paying parent. If the agreement is that the paying spouse is going to be paying all of the post-secondary educational costs, then this, I think in most cases, would result in either reduction or elimination of the child support payments to the other spouse. However, if there is a provision that the post-secondary educational costs are going to be shared by the parents, then most often it would provide that the support would continue and the, uh, the other spouse, the spouse with whom the child has been residing, their child support payments would be or could be used as that parent's contribution towards the post-secondary educational costs. So I think it really depends on the circumstances. I think the other thing that is very significant um, and that has to be considered when looking at post-secondary educational costs is to look at the tax consequences 
and to uh, at least the parties should be turning their minds and the lawyers should be turning their minds to whether these payments are going to be made on the basis of being a support payment uh, and there are precedent clauses which deal with payments to third parties and under what circumstances they can be deductible as support or it should be made very clear that these are not going to be treated as a, a tax deductible support payment. And Yolanta in her uh, material has dealt with the tax consequences and I'd ask you make sure you look at that also dealing with some of the tax consequences for joint custody those are very important and um, again it's an area of potential solicitors negligence if we don't uh, at least draw our clients attention to some of the um, problems uh, regarding tax implications of joint custody agreements where support is being paid. Um, Yolanta, one other area of um, releases that we're being asked to look at these days is in a com asking for a complete waiver of filing or separation agreements in provincial court for either indexing or uh, variation. Is there ever a time when it's appropriate to um, allow your client to sign that kind of a waiver? If the uh, agreement itself contains uh, a form of cost of living clause, particularly if it's tied strictly to the cost of living, I don't think I would have as much difficulty with respect to um, a release of the right to index. However, I don't think that the right to be able to vary an agreement by filing it with the provincial court should be waived. In looking at the, um, the precedent separation agreement as well, when the fact that the material change in circumstances provides for an application to the court, I guess the concern that I would have is it would then mean that the parties would be uh, prevented from, possibly prevented from applying to the family court to vary, they would be stuck with going to the Supreme Court on a variation application. So I think that in most circumstances um, you would not want to waive the right to be able to file the uh, agreement for purposes of variation. And Harold, uh, dealing with release clauses, we talked, um, we've talked a bit about spousal release uh, for support. Um, what about the one-time lump sum payment? What kind of a ironclad release can we include um, that will stop anybody from trying to bury that? Well, I, I think that you go as far as you can go within the, the existing law. Uh, it's funny, if you look at the, the precedents, the, 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 we keep adding words. It used to be material, then it was profound, then it was catastrophic. And now uh, I've added to my agreements radical, <laughs> tied to a pattern of dependency engendered by the marriage, whatever the magic words are in, in, in the judgments. Uh, I'm not sure whether it becomes somewhat circular if you include that as a provision of the release, given the fact that the Supreme Court of Canada has said that that's an exception uh, to the, the uh, enforcement of an agreement. So I think you do the best that you can in, in drafting your release clauses, and uh, I've included a few in there, which basically says, look, this is it, really, no kidding. You can't come back in the future. <laughs> Forget it. And, and, and that's the best that you can do. The, the other uh, way of doing it, I would think, is, is if you can look for a club to uh, really offer some disincentive to the, uh, the party who received a lump sum support uh, to come back. Uh, in the precedent material at, at page C18, the seventh subparagraph says that the parties agree that the support and property provisions of this agreement are inextricably intertwined and constitute a full and final financial settlement. I think it's important to say that. It's really no different from what Madam Justice Wilson said in, in Pellick, uh, echoing what Justice Zuber said in Farquhar, that it may be unfair to, to alter the support provisions of an agreement when they're not altering the, the, uh, the property provisions. I have included a, a, a clause in, in, in my material, which I'm not sure if it's going to be helpful or not, but it enables the, the party, the husband in, in, in that situation, to apply to the court should the wife seek to vary the terms of the support provisions. It enables the husband to apply at his option for a redistribution of the assets. And that might very well be uh, an incentive uh, or disincentive to the wife in those circumstances. Dean, how often do you get people to sign those, Harold? He oh, has all these precedents in here which no one will sign. That's right. The, the other... <laughs> I sign them myself. It's when I'm acting for both parties. I, I find it... Where's Phil? It's very, very easy to negotiate. 
Um, the other one that I, I, I uh, thought you were very brave in trying to uh, deal with, uh, Harold, is the, the tr trying to get a full release of child support, uh, an, a variation of a child support uh, term in a separation agreement. Why don't you uh, leave us with uh, that note, and I'll ask Susan one more question about uh, custody. How did, how did you uh, frame well, that? Well, in, in fact, that is uh, what it was. It was framed uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in an agreement. I, Richardson makes it pretty clear, uh, as do all the cases, that, that uh, the question of child support is still subject to the overriding jurisdiction of the court, which is broader than the jurisdiction to vary terms of spousal support. I think the best that you can do is to draft something which makes it clear that it's going to be up to the wife in the future, perhaps, to, to uh, pay for any increases in the, the child's uh, expenses as the child gets older, that the amount of support that the husband is paying is the full amount of support for present, and that the wife is going to have to bear future increases. Uh, the only other way of doing it is perhaps to add an indemnity. If, if the parties agree that this is the amount of support, and you told your client, yeah, but it's always subject to the court increasing it in the future, and you can get the wife to say, look, I'm not going to come back in the future to try to get more support for the child, you might then say, all right, then give me an indemnity. And if you uh, ever apply in the future for any uh, additional support for the child, you have to indemnify me should I be required to pay that amount. You might also want an indemnification with respect to whatever costs are incurred in defending those legal proceedings. Okay, and um, finally on this, for this uh, portion of the panel, uh, Susan, uh, there's a couple of things that have been mentioned by Phil this morning, and I, um, I think you've dealt with them in your alternate clauses, but I just ask you to maybe point out to the audience those issues regarding um, passports, uh, death of the custodial parent, and uh, change of name. Well, with, with respect to passports, um, they've changed, the passport department has changed their whole procedure now so that even where you have a situation where one parent has custody and the other parent ha only has access, the custodial parent will not be given a passport without the access parent's consent. So really in all situations now you must deal with a passport issue in the separation agreement and provide who it is that, that can make application um, and if one parent has the right to make application and the other does not, then you might want to put in a provision that the custodial parent will provide the passport to the access parent, at least for the purposes of taking the child out of the jurisdiction for vacation periods. So I think you have to examine the issue, and it is talked about in the paper that we've done. And, and the passport office will look at that separation agreement? Oh yes, the, yeah. the passport office will consider themselves bound by the separation agreement, so you're all right in, in that respect. Um, the, the second issue is the change of surname, and, and that's another very important one, and I think that many agreements that have gone out in the last few months have not been addressing the issue, which Phil mentioned. It's really a very simple provision to just put in at the end that the parties agree that the child shall rename, retain the surname of whatever unless they have the consent of the parties to the contrary, written consent. Uh, but it's just a point that must be addressed. And on the issue of... Um, the death of the custodial parent, then many, many agreements do say that upon the death of the custodial parent, custody of the child will revert to the non-custodial parent. Now how binding that is, of course, will depend upon the circumstances at the time when you have step-parents applying for custody or aunts and uncles or whatever, but at least it's a statement of present intention on the issue. Okay, uh, that's all the uh, comments for this group and I believe there's a short coffee break now. Thank you. agreement. Um, this time the panel is uh, made up of the following persons. <laughs> On my immediate uh, right is Stephen Smart, who is a partner at Osler, Hoskin and Harcourt. He was called to the bar in 1979 and his major emphasis in uh, practice is in family law. What did I say? Oh, 1970. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Stephen. Nice to be so <laughs> Um, on my uh, far left is Stephen Grant, who was called in 1939. Um, I, just, I just feel that way, actually. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, that's a typo. He was called in uh, 1975. He's a partner in Gowlings, that large spreading monolith, and his practice is primarily in family law. Ruth Mesber it was called to the bar in 1974. She's a sole practitioner in Toronto, and her practice is restricted to family law. 
the areas that uh, these uh, panelists have centered on this morning, Ruth Mesber is dealing with the matrimonial home and her uh, paper <coughs> sets out um, certain areas in, in the materials on that. Stephen Smart has dealt with net family property and Stephen Grant, uh, life insurance and estates. Um, they've addressed their minds as the morning panelists did uh, to the precedent and critiqued some of the uh, paragraphs, relevant paragraphs in that precedent and they have offered alternative clauses uh, for your use um, in redrafting your separation agreements which we will all no doubt do tonight. Um, Okay, uh, Ruth, uh, the precedent that we are using, and for those of you that have came in late, it's at uh, per, uh, section C of your materials, and um, if you want to pull it out separately, it might be helpful. Um, that uh, paragraph on matrimonial homes starts out with uh, describing the home and uh, dealing with it, and what, what's the matter with that paragraph, uh, Ruth? Well, I suppose there's, can you hear me, by the way? No? No? Is that any better? Yeah. Yes, no? All right. Um, there's nothing intrinsically wrong from a legal point of view with the paragraph, but from a drafting point of view, I think it's quite clumsy. It's preferable in your definition section of the agreement to define the matrimonial home by municipal address and legal description if you like. And then when you come to the paragraph about the matrimonial home, you don't have to repeat it. And you can simply say the parties hold the matrimonial home as joint tenants or whatever. All right, and um, something that uh, we've all had to recently think about again in um, the case dealing with whether or not you can <coughs> sever a joint tenancy, what kinds of um, th things should we be concerned about in dealing with how title is held in our agreements? Uh, what should we put in and um, uh, if you got any suggestions to the participants? Well, the most important thing is to address the issue. Most of us tend not to even think about it. You ask the client how is title held, they, said, they say joint tenancy or in one name or the other. And we tend to simply keep that as it is and not put our minds to it. The question that you must address with the client particularly if there's going to be a period of exclusive possession and the sale of the property won't happen for some time, is what happens if one of you dies? Is it your wish that the, if you die, that the whole of the property should devolve onto your spouse and should then pass uh, to his or her beneficiaries on his or her death? Or do you want your half of the property to go to your beneficiaries on your death, in which case, if it's in joint tenancy, you will want to change it to tenancy in common. Do you always recommend that the parties, if that is their wish, that they, they actually do a new deed transferring it? I'm not a real estate practitioner, but I suspect that it's better real estate practice to do that so that as far as any subsequent purchaser is concerned, they know it's as tenants in common. Um, although. It, Traditionally, the execution of a separation agreement itself was sufficient to sever a joint tenancy. I wouldn't want to rely on that. I would want the agreement specifically to deal with whether it's to continue as a joint tenancy or whether it's to be severed, especially because now a joint tenant can unilaterally sever a joint tenancy by a deed to him or herself according to the Court of Appeal. You'll find in the precedent material, by the way, at page D73, two specific clauses that deal with <coughs> joint tenancy, whether it's to be severed or not severed, and the clauses go on and talk about a remedy in case uh, one of the parties acts unilaterally and, for example, severs the joint tenancy where it was not to be severed. All right, um, what about if the parties have agreed to a period of exclusive possession, what kinds of events do you recommend that we list as um, triggering um, a immediate foregoing of that exclusive possession? Well, it's, I suppose the list is really infinite in terms of the wishes of the parties. Um, focusing on, on the legal issues, I suppose, you're generally tied into the best interests of the children. And the timing is often tied to when a child is going to complete a certain level of school, uh, when they might be changing schools, for example, if, a, if 
the youngest child is starting grade seven, you may say, well, let's finish grade eight in the matrimonial home and have it sold then, and then there'll be a move to a new high school and it won't be as disruptive. Um, although there's no legal reason for it, traditionally we put in the remarriage or cohabitation of the party in possession as being a triggering event as well. It's essentially an emotional issue more than anything else. The party out of possession feels, usually quite strongly, why should he or she defer the realization of his or her equity in the property when the spouse or former spouse is shacked up with somebody in his or her house? And that's often a triggering event. I, I think what your point uh, at the beginning of your um, comments, however, is important is at least address that issue. I, I know that I've certainly seen agreements where it hasn't been dealt with and it comes as quite a shock that a person might have a problem trying to uh, have a common law spouse evicted from the house when they've guaranteed exclusive possession to the, uh, the other spouse for a period of some 10 or 15 years. It comes as shock and anger, I might. Uh... <laughs> oh, for sure. Um, other things that, that are less usual is um, you may want to tie the sale of the house to when the mortgage comes due, for example. If, uh, if a mortgage is to run for another 18 months, the parties may decide, rather than refinancing at the end of it, let's sell the house then and, and divvy the proceeds. You also deal in your alternative clauses um, with an important uh, aspect of uh, mortgaging or financing on a house. Maybe you'd like to comment on that now, Ruth. Well, it's a clause that I came up with a few years ago when mortgage rates were so very high and one of the concerns that a party in possession often had it then it was not uncommon for the existing mortgage on the house perhaps to be at 12 or 13 percent and at the time we were looking at mortgage rates of 18 or 20 percent and parties in possession were very concerned if let's say they had a period of five years of exclusive possession and the mortgage was going to come due in a year they wanted to make sure, and you had to make sure, that the spouse out of possession would concur in the refinancing of the mortgage so that they would be able to stay in the house. Because as you know, uh, if the house is in joint tenancy, both parties have to refinance the mortgage. And if the party out of possession refused, that would often trigger the sale of a property when it wasn't intended. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll go on now to the... Uh, um Division of Net Family Property, which uh, Stephen Smart considers a misnomer anyways, uh, but deal with the property sections that are set out in the precedent then, Stephen, and if you have any comments on those for the uh, people this morning. Um, the first comment I wanted to make was, uh, if you take a look at the uh, precedent um, that is used in bar admission, uh, beginning at to page C10, uh, we run through about four or five pages dealing with different paragraphs, um, and it's not clear uh, in dealing with each separate paragraph by way of heading as to whether that's dealing with the equalization claim or not. I think uh, my first comment then is that the traditional approach in separation agreements in the past uh, up to this point in time has been a hodgepodge approach where different paragraphs uh, throughout the agreement can deal with property issues. And I think if we just stand back and look at how we've been doing it in the past, uh, th that's the obvious comment I have. I think with the uh, Family, new Family Law Act, we now have the opportunity to uh, bundle all property clauses together in one equalization claim paragraph. Um, the only, uh, the, if, if you see at page C12, there's a very short paragraph called Settlement of Rights to Division of Net Family Properties. And uh, as if that is the only clause dealing with this whole issue of equalization, whereas throughout the rest of the agreement,